What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the Quarantine Zone again, and this time we are here with Austin of The Undertaking. Thank you so much for uh, being on here today, man. It's great to be able to chat with you. Yeah, man. Thanks for having us on. Uh, stoked to be here and stoked to chat about music. Yeah, absolutely. And we got some good music to talk about, too, because we got the new album, Funeral Psalms, coming out April 30th. You have the two singles out now, No Friends and O Negative. These are badass singles. Do you feel it, that maybe this is a good representation of what the entirety of Funeral Psalms is going to sound like? Uh, yeah, we're, we're stoked with the, the two singles that are out right now. Uh, to be honest, the, the whole story behind it is when we were pitching which singles we would come out with, we kind of had a different list than what Solid State had in mind, but that was like a, such a fun conversation to kind of pitch what we wanted to put out there. And then there they countered with kind of their suggestions. And it really, what they ended up doing uh, with O Negative and No Friends, and then the two other singles that we're releasing uh, leading up to the album, all, all four of those songs kind of show like a different side of what we can do. Um, and I think we might have picked four songs that were kind of similar that that just were like high energy, um, but they were they picked songs that kind of showed a different side of of our sound. And so when you put all four of those songs together, you, you really uh, you kind of get a little glimpse of what we do a little bit more on the album. So yeah, we're stoked on what we what we put out so far. Was there kind of like a preconceived idea of what you wanted funeral psalms to sound like? Were you kind of trying to make like a continuation from what we may have heard off of the Scavengers EP, or were you kind of like trying to really redefine who um, the Undertaking is as a band? Yeah, that's a great question because um, Scavengers was kind of a. Scavengers was created in response to us needing music to get shows. <laughs> so, so we kind of th two and a half years ago when we started, we kind of threw Scavengers together pretty quickly because we were like, okay, we, if we want to play some shows, we need people to hear what we kind of sound like. So we dusted off some songs that some demos that had been sitting around for uh, a couple years, just in our folders that we had kind of thrown around when, when before we were even a band, we were always Brett, Keith, and I always kind of were um, and staying in contact and throwing stuff around. So the scavengers was created to get us shows and then the three singles that we put out that are on spotify the, the halloween themed ones with about about ghosts witch rituals and who's afraid of 11 wolves that was then us finally kind of getting together with the five core members that we have now and writing those songs and then yeah funeral songs for us really in our mind is kind of our launching point like up to this point everything else we had done was us kind of toying around with our sound and our style and different uh, vocal tones, different riff structures. And so then for funeral psalms, that was kind of us like really just unloading all the ideas that we had and really like swinging for the fences in terms of what we wanted to try to do. It's fair to say that funeral psalms is almost kind of like the record that you've always wanted to make, right? 100%. Yeah. Like in, even from the standpoint of it being a full length, uh, we were, you know, being a DIY band, we were self-funded for the longest time and always going to have to do EPs just because it wasn't financially feasible. And so, yeah, for us to be able to do like a full length, obviously that's like a dream come true on that st standpoint, but then also uh, from what we were able to do stylistically and stuff, that was definitely something that we've been, yeah, we've, we've always wanted to make this album. <laughs> yeah. And you have a great team of people supporting it, signing with Solid State and, you know, having a uh, great people uh, backing you up. So, I mean, I, I, what I like is, you know, you have a great label supporting you, great PR supporting you, but you always have that DIY edge. It almost seems like that's going to be something that you'll never lose, even if you're even if you're playing at like the most corporate venues ever. We don't want to lose it, to be honest. We never want to lose that DIY attitude. And so in our bio, sometimes we'll, we'll say we're a, cha a chaotic rock band with a can-do attitude. And typically what we found is like whenever we get to a problem that we don't know how to do, we try to learn it as quickly as possible and then try to do it ourselves. And now, yeah, like you're saying, we have this amazing team uh, between uh, Solid State and then uh, Joey Bradford, uh, who's our manager, uh, just all these different things that, that are helping us kind of move along. But then the core uh, ideology behind the band is still going to be intact that we're just going to do what we can to have fun and make our music and then if, if we can do it ourselves we'll, we'll definitely do that you know 
Yeah. And what's interesting is, is because when I listen to your music, I definitely think of it like it, it's funny because now like you're on the list of bands that I think of when it comes to a DIY uh, rock band. I think of like uh, Poison the Well. I think of Glassjaw. I think of Quicksand. I think of Every Time I Die. I really think you kind of have that sort of like post hardcore with a lot of modern flair to it. But like to me, what makes a DIY band? Because DIY, for people who don't know, it means do it yourself. But like I know people in hardcore bands that do it themselves i know people who make like music that sounds like taylor swift that's very do-it-yourself oriented is there kind of like a a diy sort of attitude that kind of applies to everything in a way oh yeah it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a stick it to the man type of thing of like oh we don't really need your help uh to accomplish our goals and I don't mean that in any slight to anybody who's helped us out because we are so grateful for every single person who's, who's come alongside us and supported us. Um, but what we take in that is is uh, up until the Funeral Psalms album, we had recorded everything almost on our own uh, in home studios. And um, our drummer is an EDM producer. Our guitarist is a, is a musician, like has all the stuff on his computer. So, so all of our demos, all of that stuff, can record ourselves um and then even music videos like we have a music video up for uh, who's afraid of 11 wolves that we shot we edited we put together uh and then everything that we had done up to this point like uh anything you saw on our social media was us learning how to do iMovie uh learning how to to just keep keeping our skills sharp so that we could do whatever we wanted together uh on our own <laughs> it seems like also because you're from San Diego, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it almost seems like the Southern California scene, like Orange County is kind of pretty close to you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I, I feel like that is a very DIY uh, sort of a real hub. I mean, with bands, look at think about all like the bands, like the hardcore metalcore bands that branched out of there between uh, you know, you guys, but you had As LA Dying, Suicide Silence, Bleeding Through, 18 Vision. I mean, I remember talking with Chris Garza of Suicide Silence, and he saw Avenge Sevenfold really cutting their teeth in that DIY scene, along with, like, bands like Atreyu and whatnot. So uh, is that sort of, is that scene in Orange County, I mean, when there are shows happening, like, is that a, still a thriving scene in San Diego as well? Yeah, I've never thought about it that way, but San Diego is such a tough, uh, environment and it might apply to Southern California as well. It's the reason why we lost the Chargers. Like, there's so much to do. Sorry, that's a football reference. So mm -hmm. yeah, San Diego, like we lost our football team, and it's like it's, it's so sad. But it's because there's so much to do that, and I, I don't want to ever sound like super prideful of San Diego, but we're we love our city. But there's like you know, on a summer night on a Tuesday, you could either go to the beach, you could go to a Padre game. You go down to the gas lamp quarter. There's so much to do. So in order to get people to come to a show, you really have to make it something that's worth their while. And so I'm wondering if because of the um, being having everybody's attention being fought for by all these different things that you can do in San Diego, that it has trained like the the hardcore and punk scene to just kind of okay, we don't care what anybody else is going to do. We're going to go out there and do our thing regardless of who's supporting us and we're going to go out there and, and, and make it work ourselves. Does that make sense? Like Absolutely. there's almost, there's almost something of like, okay, you're not going to pay attention to us. We're going to do it on our own. We don't, we don't need, uh, we don't need that. And, and I know because uh, our guitarist is uh, from uh, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And he was saying like back in the day, like the kids all went to a show because that's kind of what was going on in their town at the time. Well, it's like that a lot from, from in San Diego. It's like that a lot in New York because like there's a great like, you know, underground and a great DIY scene. But like you'll have like five big shows in New York. Like I'll never forget in April 12th of 2019, you had Baroness Death Heaven and Zeal and Otter playing one show. You had Dream Theater playing another show. You had Dance Gap and Dance at Periphery playing another show. You had Pliny playing another show. You had um, you had Uda playing another show. You had uh, Alisana playing another show. And you had Psychroptic playing another show. All while there was like 10 other underground shows happening at the same time. So, Yeah, and so you're fighting for the attention of so many different things. And you're just, you're not really concerned like, 
if you get that attention, you're going to go out there and offer up the best show that you can, you know? Yeah, definitely. Kind of going to your work as a vocalist, do you find, consider that your music to be very conceptually driven? Like, do you maybe have lyrics in mind that could influence the sound of The Undertaking? Or have you always needed the music to come up with lyrics? Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, I this is super bizarre so i'm always writing i have an i have a note on my phone that if i have an idea i kind of just jot it down and it starts just as one line or two liners and then as soon as we start to get a i try not to get too far down the rabbit hole of writing a song before i have the music and so like right now even though we're about to release funeral songs we already have demos popping around for like our next you know batch of songs whatever that looks like but but I'm once I get the demo, then I'll kind of start to make a roadmap. But I have fun with that because it's not just like random ideas. I want to come up with one, a one liner or two liner. Then I want to build a theme around that song. And then as soon as I kind of flesh out the theme for that specific song, I'll go back and just completely deconstruct my lyrics. And the final product might be something that's super different than what we started as. Because um, I need to make sure that there's like a thematic uh roadmap in that song and it actually means something because i you, you know all, all vocalists probably get to a point where they look back on a song and they're like oh i i don't that doesn't mean anything to me and there's no emotional resonance so then when i'm actually playing that song there, it does nothing to my to my like soul <laughs> yeah. and so that's something for me like i have to mean it which sounds crazy because some of my lyrics can be mean i have to mean what i'm saying in order for me to really embody the passion of that song. Yeah. Do you like to leave the lyrics open to interpretation or do you try to maybe engage the listener into like a certain message or maybe a certain emotion to see things from your point of view? I, I want to, um, are you familiar with Alex Garland? I've heard He's the, the name. director. Uh, yeah. So he did Ex Machina Annihilation. And then he just did the show last year called Dev. And he, um, he has said before that as soon as he creates something, so, so when he's creating it on his own, it's very personal, it has very specific meaning, but as soon as you release it out into the world, it is no longer his. And so for me as a vocalist, I don't wanna tell you what a song means because I don't wanna put my, my personal experience onto what you might attach to that song. Because I think that there's something so exciting to saying like, okay, I'm going to, uh, this was a very specific thing that I was trying to say here, but as soon as you listen to the song, it's going to mean something completely different to you because of your life experiences. But on that note, yeah, like we could dive into every single word on the album and there's something, there's this very specific meaning to it. So I'm always trying to find that balance between um, telling people what a song is about, but then also allowing you the in, uh, ability to interpret it. it interpret that song in your own way well you know i think all art is open to interpretation you're you know there's millions and millions of people in the world people are going to listen to us and ev everybody listens to the same song they're going to have different conclusions on it i mean even like a song oh, at, even a song as upfront and as obvious as a song like killing in the name by rage against the machine i mean everybody knows that that's about the rodney king wrote this but there are so many people who either resonate with them personally it's very relevant now so like but like I feel like there is a best of both worlds because I feel like yeah. you don't you don't want to be preachy. You don't want to be like it's this and only this, but at the same time, I and this could be my personal opinion, uh, but I sometimes just saying, "Oh, it's whatever you want it to be" could sometimes be a cop out or could kind of like be too vague to the point where like, you know, it, it, it makes the art look a little weak in my eyes because I feel like an artist should oh, be 100%. A, like the artist should be able to defend their own work and be able to explain it. So I'd imagine if a listener asks you, you know, like if you're having a conversation with your listener and they were to like ask you what a song like, uh, you know, No Friends is or any of the singles that you have or any of the songs on the new album, you wouldn't hesitate on explaining it to them, right? Oh, 100%. No, that, that's what I mean. Like every single lyric on this album has a very specific meaning and has been thought through. And even as I go through now, knowing that people are going to listen to it and critique the lyrics, I am even going even further down the rabbit hole and making sure like I know, okay, what was my intention when I wrote this uh, line? And if somebody asks me, oh, what does it mean when all your friends are scavengers? Like, okay, I'm like, okay, I know that that's like, 
you have all these friends that are just trying to find uh, ways that they can use you to their own benefit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because, and also, like, the titles in himself, I feel like, are enough to draw you in. Because, you know, Plague is definitely uh, going to be a word that many people are going to resonate with in for the last couple of years, in case, you know. But then you have a song like, I don't, uh, I really don't want to be here, which could have, like, multiple interpretations. Is it, like, very spiritually oriented? Is it very, you know, like, I don't want to... You know, I, I really don't want to be here. It, it's like a depressing version of should I stay or should I go? Um, I know, right? Yeah. Dude, I, I was actually inspired by that because of the night um, of the big riots in Georgia. Uh, kill, a, uh, kill a Mike B. No, uh, big Mike, or I'm botching who it was, uh, got on that press conference with the mayor of Georgia or Atlanta. I'm, I'm botching the reference here, but he got up on the mic and he gave one of these amazing eloquent speeches about um just i don't know whatever he was talking about and the first thing he said is i really don't want to be here and i love the idea that like even though he didn't want to be there in the moment on camera talking about these race riots and all this kind of stuff he still owned that moment uh, and came forward and i don't know i don't know if you remember that but that's totally what it is about it's like you know, sometimes you don't want to be in a specific moment, but you still have to be there and show up and do your thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, and, and, you know, obviously pertaining to an issue that is very prevalent, but I feel like that is representative of everything that we have been facing for the last uh, couple of years, whether it is, you know, the social unrest, the pandemic, the, yep. uh, the, the election that was like being awake during open heart surgery. Like it was, uh, yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, but, uh, but like it, it almost seems like you could take inspiration from multiple sources, right? There is like a you know maybe research that's involved, but there's also personal experiences as well that could influence the lyricism as well, right? Of course, for for me specifically, we've been kind of talking about how this album was created and kind of birthed during the pandemic. We recorded it in August 2020, uh, so kind of right in the middle of the election cycle. We were you know about halfway through the pandemic, even though it's still going all that kind of stuff. And so I was able to capitalize on uh, political unrest, social unrest, race riots, a pandemic, people getting furloughed, all these different influences that were going on in the world at the time. And I was able to kind of take that in personally. And that's kind of what was in, it, this album was inspired by it. So there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of anger that comes through because this last year was a pretty bad year, all things considered. Um, but then I'm going to I'm going to uh, float in uh, pop culture references and I'm going to try to make it a little bit consumable. So it's not this like super dour, tough hang uh, for people to listen to. But as you go through the album, there's stuff that you can personally resonate with. And then in the middle of one of our songs, I say Calabunga. So, I mean, like, let's have a little bit of fun with it as well. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're all going to die. Let's have fun. No, no, exactly. That's the, that I love that you said that it's in that tone too, is the juxtaposition of the undertaking is our artwork is going to be dark. Um, our sound is going to be aggressive. Our lyrics are going to be aggressive. But then on the flip side, we're just a bunch of dudes from Southern California that the goal of this band is to get together and play music and have fun with our friends. Yeah. Uh, and there's a huge balance between that of we're taking our art seriously, but we're also having a ton of fun doing it. Well, you know, what kind of reminds me of going back to the Every Time I Die reference, because Keith uh, Buckley is also in the band The Damn Things, which is um, easily one of the funnest bands I've ever listened to in my life. Like, I don't know if you've ever, sure. yeah, I don't know if you've listened to The Damn Things, but their music is rock and roll party all at the same, like it is a straight up rock and roll party. But if you analyze their lyrics, I mean, they're singing, they're singing about murder, they're singing about Satan, they're singing about you know, like, uh, you know, like everything dark. But they make it so fun to listen to. It's like the funnest music of the most depressing subject matters. So I feel like maybe the Undertaking has a similar sort of mojo. That's kind of what we're going for is that it's fun. There's something you can bob your head to, but then as soon as you start to like listen to, like you're saying, like. I really don't, I'd probably say it often in the album, but like, I, I really don't want to be here. I'm saying, you know, when hope is hopeless, we're all going to die. But that's also on top of like a, a riff that just makes you want to bob your head. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And uh, the final question I wanted to ask you is, I'm probably asking this way uh, too far in advance, being that Funeral Psalms isn't even out yet. But, you know, 
first off, I want to say that for a debut full-length album, you're hitting the ground running. This is a great album, and I'm really excited for the rest of the world to hear it. And, you know, huge shout-out to Solid State for, you know, uh, further promoting some awesome uh, bands. Is there just, um, like, do you think that maybe that this is going to be the direction that you're going to stick with from now on? Because you mentioned that you are demoing some new stuff. Is this going to be kind of like the sound you're going to want to stick with, or do you maybe want to kind of experiment a little bit more for The Undertaking? I think we'll always experiment. Uh, I never want to be stuck in a box that says that this is what our sound is. And th thank you for the compliment on the album. We're, we're really proud of it and really stoked for people to hear the uh, full 11 songs. And I think people are going to have some, uh, they're going to have fun listening to it. Um, and even on the album, you can kind of hear a lot of different references and different genres that we're kind of toying around with. And even within our band, there's a lot of different references that we pull into. Like Keith's favorite band, one of his favorite bands is Dillinger. And Johnny's going to come from more of a singer-songwriter perspective or like Acid He Burns that's a little bit more uh, melodic. And so their two guitar styles are going to kind of meet in the middle to what we're doing here. Uh, Joey, our manager, who was also our producer and recorded the album here in San Diego, is the guitarist of the U's. And so he's going to come from it with a kind of a, a, a pop emo songwriter perspective. And that's kind of where you get some of our melodies and harmonies that you hear on the album are kind of coming from that influence. And so for us, we're always going to kind of dig in to be a little bit, I hate that bands will always say oh, our next album is going to be heavier, um, but we would definitely just want to be, continue to be aggressive. And, and our through line with our music is always going to be energy, that everything that you listen to of ours is going to have kind of that pulse, that beat that kind of keeps moving you forward. And so for us, even the demos that we uh uh, are floating around now are kind of unhinged and i think that that's what we're always trying to go is we're trying to take our music to the point where it's about to fall apart but then we kind of pull it back together uh with like a chorus or something uh something of a hook that you can kind of get uh, stuck in your head yeah and not to mention you 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 have a collaboration with seosin on this album so i almost feel like the sky is the limit because seosin you know they kind of have like a lot of that emo that i hate that term so much but like that emo sort of vibe behind it and you know working with joy of the yeah. use like it almost seems like you're going to be able to have a sound or maybe even just a vibe that will appeal to multiple audiences from like the hardcore kids to like the more new school rock fans to the again i hate the word but for lack of better words it's just journalism the emo crowd you know yeah well, that's what we're always going for is that there's going to be something for everybody in each one of our songs. Like we're firmly rooted that you bring up the damn things. Like there's a, there's a lot of like rock and roll uh, roots in our songs and stuff. And so you, when you listen to it, it's not just going to be one genre. You're going to hear different things. And hopefully somebody who maybe isn't uh, attached to no friends is able to attach themselves to take me down the river or ranches that have these kind of bigger grandiose choruses that we're playing with. And the hope would be that there's something for, for everybody, but then also uh, there's common ground on the whole album. Awesome. Yeah, and Cove, Cove's our homie, so we, we absolutely love working with Cove. Yeah, can't go wrong with that. I mean, Seo Sin was... Everybody who was born in 1993, like myself, everybody loved Seo Sin at one point in their life. So. Sure. Yep. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And uh, again, looking forward to the rest of the world hearing the album. Is there just anything else uh, with the undertaking that you would like to promote? Obviously, you know, thanks to a certain virus that shall not be named, uh, shows aren't happening at the moment. But I'd imagine that when shows do pick up again, we'll be seeing you on the road quite a bit. Is there a chance maybe you could bring uh, the undertaking to the hardcore capital, New York City? We honestly do. We would love nothing more than to get on the road and especially get on the East Coast and stuff. I know uh, there's a lot of big pockets of hardcore. And uh, dude, like this year sucks because our show is something that we're very proud of. We like never stay on the stage. We're always hopping on people. And I just can't wait for people to get either vaccinated or get healthy again so that we can we can play shows and I know the industry is starting to wake up a little bit. And so we're really excited to find out which opportunities are there for us. Yeah. yeah I, we can't wait. I had a dream the other night that I was at a hardcore show and, there, and there was a barrier and instead of security, you had like all the expert, the health experts. So you like, you had Fauci in the security yeah, uniform yeah. and Alsterholm <laughs> in the security uniform, just being like, no, 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 no. The, no yeah. cloud surfing, <laughs> but so hopefully those. Is streams... that a uh, is that a Lincoln Park tattoo on your wrist? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, hybrid theory. Yep. 
I got it after uh, Chester passed ta- away. Oh, I love it. Uh, I just got done talking to somebody about how that was one of the most influential albums for me as a vocalist. Just when that came out, that was so so good. Yeah, that's one of my favorite al- That That is my favorite album of all time, and it's always going to be. It's perfect, dude. It's like they had such a great sound, and they like so heavily influenced that whole new metal scene. Yeah, they're they're so good. The only <laughs> album in history to have screaming on it that went diamond. So. Okay, I didn't know that. Yep, learned that from uh, my friend Joe at Loudwire. But uh, thank you uh, so much for your time today. Uh, really, uh, again, I'm excited for the rest of the world to hear the. Uh, the whole album everybody we are here with the undertaking be sure to check out funeral psalms coming out via solid state records april 30th this is alex from heavy new york and we will see you next time